this is one of the biggest sort of loopholes. It's pretty much, uh, you tell me, but it must be the only way in Australia to make (laughs) tax-free income. You'd be surprised. A lot of, a lot of people do it. Um, And I've, very rarely seen the ATO kind of come down on it. It's yeah. the only way to make tax-free money <laughs> yeah. in Australia yeah. at the moment. In today's video, we have accountant Nick Hill taking us through the one way you can make income in Australia without having to pay tax. He also takes us through, if you're thinking about buying an investment property, the things you need to be aware of, if you're thinking about turning your current home into an investment property, what to do, and how to correctly structure your portfolio if you're looking at making wealth from property investment. It's an action-packed video, so I hope you get lots of value from it. Let's jump right in. moment, like a lot of people who've bought properties over the last two or three years have sort of built up a lot of equity. And, and the question I'm getting mm-hmm. asked a lot is like, if I'm thinking about turning my home into an investment property and then buying a new yeah. rental in potentially, what should I do? Like, what's some questions you should think about? And the- shifting like a main residence to an investment property. Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty big topic, that one. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that can come out of it, but there's also a lot of risk areas as well. Um, Ultimately, uh, with with uh, with your main residence, there's uh, there's this um, amazing tax incentive called the main residence exemption, where effectively, if you choose to sell your property um, that you lived in, um, you ultimately pay no tax on the gain, which is which is amazing. So uh, it's a little bit different for rental properties, where ultimately any capital gain you earn on the rental property is taxed again at the rate um, that your personal position falls into. However, if you're shifting a uh, main residence to an investment property, uh, one of the big ones you need to consider is obviously this main residence exemption. There's this great rule called the uh, six year main residence exemption, uh, where uh, ultimately, if you shift your main residence to an investment property, you could still claim, um, ultimately you could sell this property within a six year period of doing this transition and still pay no tax on sale, which is amazing. Like that's, that's awesome. Like a six year growth, can't beat that. So that's a great part. The double-edged sword there is you gotta be really careful if you go and do that, but then decide to declare another main residence during that period, it pretty much wipes that out. So you've gotta be really careful. For example, perfect, perfect scenario, you go, uh, you've got a house in Brisbane, but you want a sea change. You want to go live on the sunny coast and um, rent out your, your home here. You shift it to an investor property. You take out a rental at the Sunshine Coast. So you don't own it. It's not your main residence. And uh, you could effectively live there, live there for six years, paying rent, building the equity in your Brisbane property. And then say five years in, you go, yeah, time to sell. Prop, uh, the market's hot. Make a big gain pay zero tax. Brilliant. Then you go out, take that money, say you want to then shift into a main residence in the sunny coast. Bam. That's a perfect thing to consider when you're shifting from a main residence to investment property for sure. Yeah. I, I think let's come back to that, but um, more on the the capital gains exemption for a home. because I think this yeah. is one of the biggest, I guess the loophole it's there. People know about it, but in yeah. the case where, um, you know, in that example where say you're moving from Brisbane, going to the Sunshine Coast, um, potentially say if you bought a home on the Sunshine Coast, is there anything yeah. you should do like getting evaluation on your previous home at the time you leave? Like what's some stuff that you should yeah, potentially absolutely. think about doing so, at that point? If, if you do do kind of uh, a jump between main residents, um, that does obviously that, that puts you into that risk area. Uh, but what you can do is at that point, uh, you can, if you shift from one main res to another or declare a new main residence, you can actually organize a valuation at that point in time on the original property uh, to then lock in that increased value. Like you do this on the basis that the property's gone up in value. And so you can lock that in, which in, in fact will increase your cost base, which will then in the future, if you do go to sell it, uh, minimize your, your capital gains tax. So yeah, that's a perfect way to, to do it. If you kind of don't fall into that perfect scenario of, being able to claim the full six years, uh, you can ultimately look to trigger evaluation once you do shift one, one, from one main residence to another. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge win as well. Yeah, that's a huge one. I, hear, I see it a lot, you know, where you might have bought a property originally for 300,000, you move out five mm-hmm. years later, it's worth 500,000. Um, you yeah. get a valuation when it's worth 500. So when you go and sell yeah. it, it's not, you know, the capital gains aren't calculated on the original 300 purchase price, it's on the 500. And it's kind of yeah. can help you save tax on that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Or, or I guess you can get a, 
you, you can get stuff. It's harder to get it backdated, I suppose. It's a point in time. So it's definitely something you probably want to think about when you're doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, when it comes to the ATO, the onus of proof is always on the taxpayer, unfortunately. Um, so getting valuations dated back three, four, five years, traditionally, you know, lose, it loses a bit of credibility. But if you get the valuation yeah, at that point in time, in the, when you're looking to do the transition, it definitely stacks up a lot more effectively. So yeah, 100%. Yep. And so that back to the capital gains tax exemption, I think this is one of the biggest sort of loopholes. It's pretty much, uh, you tell That's me, but it must be the only way biggest. in Australia to make <laughs> tax-free income. Um, yeah. So like, I guess, practically, how does that work? Is there a limit? Do you have to live in the home for a certain amount of time to claim to be able to sort of profit? Like what if you bought a yeah. home off the plan, it settles tomorrow and I move out the next day? For hundred thousand yeah. dollars profit, do I get to keep that hundred grand? Like, what are some of the rules around that? That you know, tax free income. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. There's there's a rule of thumb of six to twelve months. Um, like the longer the longer you're in there, the more it's going to stack up. Well, but that's not it's not the be all and end all. It it really comes down to intention as well. Um, if you can you know, obviously live in there for a minimum of six months, that kind of works really effectively. Uh, but sometimes you find that you've chosen to uh, buy the family home uh, and then there's some personal circumstances that are kind of blown up in your face and you've got to make a transition out. You do, the one thing that you do need to do though is you need to make sure you move in straight away. Right? That's, that's actually one that catches a lot of people out. Um, I've seen, I've come across scenarios where individuals have purchased their main residence, uh, but it was rented. And so what's happened is uh, following the data settlement, it was rented for three months. Um, and a lot of people actually believed that um, as long as you can move in at the earliest, like the convenient time, that that period doesn't count, but it does. If you have that, someone renting from date of you settling, it actually throws the main residence out, which is a huge, huge uh, punishment to, to the person moving in. So the one thing you want to do is move in straight away. The longer you're in there, the more that works in your favor. Um, but general rule of thumb, six to 12 months gets you the win. Um, but yeah, if you move in for three months and then personal circumstances have you having to jump ship, that can work in your favor. You just need to prove intent. And, prove and, that and for most people own. though, and I guess like if, if you're doing this once, you buy a house, you move out in 12 months and you move to another one, it like, it's generally okay, but for mm. people that do this as a profession, um, yeah. surely the ATO would be on that, right? Like if I bought a house every 12 months and one day, sold yeah. it for a massive profit and then did it rinse and repeat every year and every year, like although I'm going to be yeah. tax-free as like living in, you know. You'd think, but, um, you'd think the ATO would be more on it, uh, but it's uh, common practice, uh, especially you see it in uh, construction, the construction game people that do this for a living uh ultimately if um yeah you have your main residence you move in um they traditionally do a little bit of it up um be able to sell it for a profit um it, me it meets the rules and wow. uh at the end of the day uh yeah it's um it's a tough argument for the ato uh the more you do it the more argument you give to the ato to obviously investigate and question what you're doing but you'd, you'd be surprised. A lot of a lot of people do it, um, and I've very rarely seen the ATO kind of come down on it. Wow! So arguably, it's yeah. the only way to make tax-free money <laughs> yeah. in Australia yeah. at the moment. Clear point. Like I do see a lot at the moment where um, first home buyers, home buyers are buying a home to live in, but it's rented for three or six months. Um, then yep. they're going to move into it. So, are there any risks of buying a property in that circumstance? Like, say, if you if it was rented for three months, you move in there, you still meet the banks owner occupied rules, the stamp G exemptions, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Are there any risks for when you go and sell it in like five years that it was technically an investment property? Do you have to do anything different on your tax because yeah. you're a landlord for three months? What's some stuff to look yeah. out for? You? Technically, uh, you've got a three month period which is effectively taxed. So uh, you, sell it, you sell it at the five year mark, um, three months, like what's that? That's oh, something like 5% of the whole ownership period. Technically, you should be paying tax on the 5%. Um, wow yeah it's a bit of a bit of a sneaky one um but you know that's that's a five-year period a lot happens in five years uh wow. you know, it's, it's tough to track 
to be honest. Uh, but it is technically a, a risk area you need to be careful of. Um, so what you ultimately want to do is get the get the renters out before you move in. Okay. No, that's yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, or extend settlement. I've had some clients do that because it, it does cause issues with like the first home loan deposit scheme. You have to move in within six months. So if there's a lease yeah. in place, like it, it causes dramas. Um, yeah. So that's but that's probably the first way to to save. You know, to pay no tax. Um, the second yeah. way to pay tax is is depreciation and and sort of running expenses on there. I know yeah. you're not a depreciation expert per se, but it's something you deal with mm -hmm. a lot. Do you want to explain yeah, how that works? Because obviously there were some rule changes a couple of years ago where this this was this changed pretty dramatically, but how does it kind of work today on an existing property or on a property? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's two different types of uh, depreciation. I'll keep it fairly simple. You know, you've got your your, your standard depreciation, which is uh, I don't know fridge, freezers, uh, lounges, all of the the kind of things you could take away with you, uh, the furniture, effectively. Um, and then you've got your capital works deduction, which is um, depreciation of the physical property so the house itself um the you know the bedrooms the the, the infrastructure effectively so there's, there's these two different deductions that are available to you uh they work they work quite differently uh the depreciation of furniture uh you can write that off a lot more aggressively so you're looking at uh effective life which is the life of the furniture um let's just use a fridge for example could be four years pay $1,000 for a fridge, you can claim a $250 deduction each year for four years, right? Um, so that's a pretty straightforward one. The capital works on the other hand, uh, being on the house itself uh, is at a flat 2.5% over 40 years. So it's not a massive deduction, uh, but it's consistent for the life of, that you're kind of renting out the property. Uh, both these the deductions, uh, what I call notional, so you're not physically paying for them every year, but you're getting the deduction because you've pretty much paid for them, you know, either on purchase of the property or you've gone out and bought the furniture. Um, <clears throat> both of these deductions work against bringing your taxable income down. And that's where this, this one is probably the biggest one other than interest that helps you drive a positively geared property into a negatively geared property. Which helps you cash flow um, and like, I guess it helps... Yeah. yeah, withholding it at the end of the year because you might get a refund. Um, yeah. I guess down that similar vein, like what are some other expenses that you can claim on a property that you're renting? Yeah. Well, one of the big ones that people don't know about, which is a bit of a win, is obviously to, to be able to claim depreciation and um, capital works, you need to, the ATO requires you to get a quantity surveyor's report now. Um, and that's pretty much a report that tells you what you're allowed to claim based on the, the assets in the house, the furniture in the house, and then the value of the house. That quantity surveyor's report is going to cost you money, but that's fully deductible. So basically, you can claim a deduction on getting a deduction, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's typically a win. And, and when I tell uh, most homeowners about that, they pretty much go and get the report straight away because why not? Um, beyond that, <clears throat> interest is your second biggest deduction, nine times out of 10. Uh, so the interest on the home loan that you pay throughout the year, it's a great deduction. And sometimes you can get a win on that by doing prepayments of interest. Uh, I don't see it very often anymore, but um, yeah, it is a, a, a nice little windfall. But you've got to consider the year on year effect of that interest, because if you do a prepayment, what you're effectively doing is you're bringing next year's deduction forward a year. So you just got to be careful with that. You want to do it when your tax rate is at its at its peak, or maybe you just want to kind of double down on your on your refund. So you do it in that that year. So those are the two biggest deductions. Then from there, you know, you've got your council rates, you've got your body corps for your townhouses and um, apartments. Uh, you've got uh, insurances, so you want to take insurance out over the property, which is fully deductible. Uh, you might have to pay some bank fees throughout the year. Again, deductible water rates, utilities. Um, another big one, uh, well, one that can be potentially big is repairs. Uh, so you could one year have a repair of a hundred bucks, fully deductible. You might have to go out and do some pretty significant repairs one year. Um, they can really add up and you can pretty much get a really good deduction in that instance. I probably just disclaim you've got to be really careful with repairs. Uh, they can transition into what's called renovations or improvements 
once it falls into that realm, it goes under this quantity surveyors report concept that I've spoken about. So if that's the case, a repair is 100% deductible, but if it falls under a, a, a renovation, it falls under that depreciation rule and ultimately is depreciated over a period of time. So you just gotta be careful with that. But those are, those are the big, big deductions that are available. Uh, I don't like to talk about what we miss out on, but uh, unfortunate rules changing a few years ago. Uh, a lot of people used to travel to their rentals uh, and claim uh, flights and, and uh, you know, car allowances and stuff like that. The ATO pretty much ripped that out. Uh, so if anyone's telling you you can claim travel to rental properties, they're living in the past, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and it, it was a big loss for a lot of people. You know, they were actually using the Gold Coast you know, tourism market, exactly. <laughs> Margaret River. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the interstate travel uh, to go check out the rental and do repairs. Um, it was a big loss, but um, it is what it is. Yeah, they made John. That, he used to fly up every year to Sydney, or well, from Sydney yeah. to the Gold Coast, and that was his thing. But yeah, like it changed a couple yeah. of years back. Um, when their first investment property. A lot of times you kind of just go in there without thinking, don't talk to an accountant, don't look at stuff. Like mm -hmm. what's, why would you talk to your accountant before you buy an investment property? What's some stuff that you've seen that can go wrong? And I yep. guess stuff like tips that you give to people to try and maximize the tax deductions mm -hmm. overall. Big, big one that I deal with a lot is the structure, the structuring side of things, um, purchasing it in the right, right entity. Uh, even if we don't overcomplicate it and do like a review of companies and trusts, even looking at the individuals. So, uh, you know, you might have a mum and dad team where the dad uh, ultimately has a effective tax rate of 47%, which is huge. Um, and then the wife uh, makes no money, stay at home with the kids, for argument's sake, uh, has no taxable income. Now, you know, talking really in isolation, and obviously this is general, so each circumstance is different. But if you were to say have a positively geared property and you put that in the husband's name, you're paying 47% tax. So for every dollar you earn positively gear wise, you're pretty much paying the tax man 47 cents. All right. So in that case, it's a no brainer. You'd be putting it in, in the wife's name where she's not making any money on any income. You pretty much probably pay no tax on the positively geared property, which is awesome. Flip side on that, if you're looking at negative gearing, same scenario, and then you put it in the wife's name, or even if you split it 50-50, right? So we want to hedge our bets. That's all well and good, but you've now lost 50% of the deduction going into the wife's name because she has no taxable income, right? And so you're kind of losing out on a tax saving in the, in the husband's name or wow. the dad's name, which, so you've got to be really careful with that. That's a lot of advice that we give is finding the right, place because each each circumstance is different uh sometimes uh people want to look at investment trusts as well got to be careful with that because uh if it's a negatively geared property the losses get captured in the trust you can't use them so again like why would you put it in the trust in that case um you've also got to be careful land tax land tax in the individual's name is quite high throw it in a trust it pretty much halves it goes down to like 350k which if you've got a land rich property in a family trust or, or a company, you're paying land tax every year that you wouldn't have otherwise paid if it was in your personal name. So you gotta be really careful with, with little things like that. Um, or big things like that, to be honest, land tax is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess there's a lot to consider there. Cause even the common thing is, you know, buying a first investment property, current properties in both our names, we're going to buy it together. You go and sign the yep. contract, put in both names and the simple thing of just putting two names on the contract to sale, like you said, can have pretty huge impacts on tax, even in the future. Um, you know, any ongoing cash flow depends on, I guess, the aims of that property. So it's pretty big. Yeah. yeah. And you got to, I guess, also consider the long-term perspective as well. You know, when I was talking about the, the husband and wife team, um, you know, you've got your short-term strategies, but you've also got to consider long-term as well. So yeah, got to got to make sure you consider quite a number of things. It's not as simple as just buying a property um, in so and so's name, thinking you can fix it later, because a transfer out actually costs a lot of money. Um, the only way to avoid transfer duties or costs of transferring is uh, separation, so family court, which <laughs> don't necessarily want to go down that path. Not ideal. <laughs> no. it's, a, it's the most expensive way to get out of a property. Yeah, it's pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> um, 
mate, that, that's awesome. I think we might wrap it up there. So um, if people want more information on you and your business, Walker Hill, do you want to um, tell us a bit more about what you guys do and, and where we can find yeah. you? Yeah, no worries. So Walker Hill, uh, we deal with uh, small businesses and uh, uh, high net wealth individuals uh, looking to get into the property market as well. Um, uh, we do our, our backbone services, compliance and tax, uh, but we do a fair bit of advisory and uh, structuring. So, you know, we've got a couple of clients that, uh, you know, we've kind of helped with their property portfolios, getting them into the companies, trusts, and even just looking at splitting it between mom and dad teams. So we do a variety of that kind of work and um, help people uh, ultimately get the right structure based over uh, Petrie Terrace, just around from Caction Street in Brisbane. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're ever interested in finding out a little bit more about how we can help you, nick at walkerhill.com.au, that's the best bet, or um, 3367-3155. Cool. Thanks for your time, mate. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you.